Back for the web now with James Fallows. Uh, one of the hot button, very hot button issue, just to say the least, immigration. You found yeah. so many of the communities that are welcoming. Yes. Or prospering. This was another surprise to us that the gap between the national level discourse about immigration and the way this reality is being lived most places we went. My understanding of the history of immigration through America's, say, the last two centuries is that it's always been disruptive in the short term, whether you're talking Germans or Irish or Italians or Greeks or Vietnamese or whatever over the last 150 years. But the, the assimilative process of the United States is powerful. And the second and third generations of these people look back and say, well, of course, you know, we don't speak German anymore. We don't speak Vietnamese anymore. We're part of the, uh, the American fabric. And city by city, that's still pretty much what we found, including in Midwestern towns that were becoming very significantly Latino, in places with large refugee populations, especially uh, Fresno, California, and Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Burlington, Vermont, and Erie, Pennsylvania, with lots of African refugees, a sense that the ongoing absorption was continuing. So the gap is between a national rhetoric of, you know, this is a big threat, this is polarizing, and a sense of at easeness about it most places where it's happening, and significantly the places in polls where people are most concerned about immigration is where the least of it has happened. Immigrants are the engine that keeps this community alive, said a leader in Dodge City, Kansas to you. Yes, and this was a person who made clear to us that he considered himself an evangelical Christian, a political conservative. He was a supporter of Donald Trump at the time we were there. But he also said that for the community, for the schools, for the cultural richness, they needed the new population in town to keep their town vibrant, and he said he thought this was a good thing for the town, including the city financial manager, Ernesto de la Rosa, who was in town on a DACA waiver because he was brought by his parents when he was a child from Mexico. But so that, that sort of contrast of politically, this man said he has sort of supported a national ticket that was against immigrants, uh, but in his town he thought this was the town's future. Another thing, you found even in, in small towns, small, small, small towns, you need a downtown, you need yeah. an urban, something yeah. resembling an urban core. Yeah. Yes, and that, that there is a wave of, just as the 50s, 60s, and 70s were characterized by urban sprawl and by these, these uh, parking lot centric malls, the last 10 years has been characterized by the recovery of lots of downtowns. And there still is a lot in the United States that has good bones of downtown structures built from like the 1850s to the 1930s or so for between Civil War and World War II that may have been aluminum siding over, they may have been abandoned, but they're there. And so really it's hard to convey how broad a movement this is, the sort of downtown rediscovery with um, younger people and retirees living downtown and businesses moving there and restaurants and brew pubs and stores and a sense of people wanting to live that way. Along yeah. those lines, you, 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 you note that um, young age regardless, yeah. entrepreneurship may be a, is a lot easier in say, maybe Redlands, California yeah. than in San Francisco yeah. or in Marlton, Arkansas than Little Rock, Arkansas. Yes. It's just cheaper. You can do more with your capital dollars. Indeed, and there are half a dozen cities in the United States where the cost of real estate destroys your life. San Francisco, Seattle, New York, and then there's another group of cities where real estate is a significant cost. And then there's a whole lot of the U.S. where real estate is cheap. <laughs> and you can, we heard again and again in Fresno that they were trying to attract people from the Bay Area of California saying, look, it's one-fifth the cost to have your house or to have your dance troupe or to have your art studio or to have your startup here in Fresno. So why not do that and take the train into San Francisco when you want? You uh, mentioned earlier the, the old, uh, of, of a century, almost a century ago, the CC, or not CCC, but the uh, Works Progress, yeah. the Great New Deal yes. initiatives. And you note in, in yeah. the text that uh, the prevailing political ethos yeah. right now does not suggest yeah. in the near term any sort yeah. of 
significant public investment yeah. in infrastructure, yeah. education, really anything other than Pentagon, not to dismiss yeah. that, but... but uh, would you like to hear my hope? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me let me share with the audience your fear as yeah. I read it, and yeah. you referred to the Gilded Age, and you say, oh, "Look, we're in one again. Yeah. We're you don't use the word plutocracy, yeah. but that seems to underlie it." it. Would be I, only because I, I forgot to use it, because <laughs> that that would apply. And so, yes, as as you note, essentially every problem we have here has its antecedent, antecedent or parallel in the original Gilded Age of disruption and, and extremes and political cynicism and political corruption and all the rest. And so my hope is, and the reason that Deb and I are trying to spread this message and want to spend some time doing this in the future is to let people know there is this other force in current American life and that in, in the current balance of for America's future, to hope that the renewal that's happening in many places can bubble up as opposed to the poison seeping down. And that, that's frankly what I'm trying to do. How, how strong is that movement? Can you measure I, I think it is, is quite strong and, and that public opinion polls suggest on a factual basis what I feel anecdotally, which is that in most parts of the country, people feel better about the place they live than they do about the country as a whole. And so their own experience is that despite real problems of opioids or dislocation or whatever else, that their movement is positive rather than negative, even in West Virginia. They feel as if they are making some positive movement. So I, I assert, and, and opinion polls really do show that, three-fourths of the people think the country is going in the wrong direction. Three-fourths of the people feel their own communities are going in the right direction. So trying to trying to reconcile that difference in a good way rather than a bad way is what I hope for. All right, James Fallows for the web. Thanks very much. My pleasure.